The removal of a YouTube video is sparking controversy, and it all started with dumplings. One mother fights for justice after her young son was killed in a fire. She blames China's emergency response workers for shirking responsibility. The U.S., U.K., and Canada take a stance against forced labor in China's Xinjiang region. They're now blocking imports like cotton and tomato products. A congressional office is objecting to the delivery of Chinese propaganda. That says a Chinese state-run publication is sent out to U.S. House members. And one expert draws parallels between what's happening in the U.S. and events in communist China. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A famous YouTuber is now sparking controversy after he took down a video on dumplings, all because of a guest he invited. We talked to the guest in the video, and here's what he has to say. Our reporter Juliet Song has the story. A famous YouTuber is facing criticism after he removed a video about dumplings. In it, he invited、Uncle、a guest onto、Roger. the show. Today, Uncle Roger gonna watch this video. Epicurious, how to make every dumpling, and I have special guest today. He knows so much about dumpling, and he gonna react with me. Please welcome nephew Mike from Strictly Dumpling. Uncle Roger is a comedian based in the UK. Mike Chen is a video creator from the US. Both built their fame around food and have more than three million fans on YouTube. Meanwhile, Chen is an outspoken critic of the Chinese Communist Party or the CCP. He has been very vocal about Beijing's persecution of Christians, Uyghurs, and Falun Gong practitioners. Uncle Roger posted the video on his YouTube channel this Monday, but he removed the video the next day and wrote an apology to his Chinese fans on social media platform Weibo. In it, he says, "I realize the video has created a negative social impact." To which Mike Chen responded, "I get why he did it." Uh, I don't hold any animosity towards him because I understand the pressure he would feel if、uh, if he really wants to have a a market over over in the mainland.、Um, but I did feel like、um, uh, it it was a little too much what he wrote. Chen is referring to the part in the statement where Uncle Roger said he wasn't aware of Chen's political thoughts and incorrect comments about China in the past. He also hopes his Chinese fans can quote give Uncle Roger, who just entered China, a chance to improve. He could have just said, "Okay, you know,、um, he didn't agree with my viewpoints," and leave it at that. But to go the extra mile, I felt was a little too,、um, a little too much effort to try to appease the CCP. Or the crowds,、um, or the people inside mainland China who are, who had a problem with me being on his show. Chen has been raising awareness about human rights issues in China. In an Instagram post last June, he talked about China's Tiananmen Square massacre. On June 3, 1989, the CCP sent tanks to crush the pro-democracy movement at Tiananmen Square. Their troops fired at unarmed protesters. Chen adds that he's critical of the regime, not the Chinese people. China is beautiful. China has a long-standing history. It has beautiful culture. It's based on truthfulness. It's based on spirituality.、Um, it's based on compassion, and the Chinese people are embodies those characteristics. He says the regime has been pushing the propaganda that if you don't have the CCP, then you don't have China. Because of that indoctrination, people still think. To this day, a lot of people inside China that okay, if you insult the CCP, you're insulting Chinese people, you're insulting China, which is not true at all. Chen says the CCP ruined many people's lives, but those who speak out risk being persecuted, and he's just trying to give a voice to those who desperately need it. Some internet users criticized Uncle Roger's decision under his tweet. NTD reached out to him for comment, but didn't get a response before airtime. Juliet Song, NTD News. One mother in China is fighting an eight-year battle for justice. Her efforts followed the death of her 12-year-old son, who was killed in a building fire. She says her son's life could have been saved if not for local firefighters' poor efforts to save him. NTD's Don Ma has more. The mother of a 12-year-old in China is calling out Chinese firefighters' poor response times and what she calls their evading of responsibility. That's after her son perished inside a burning building. 
She says authorities stole the boy's corpse in the middle of the night, cremated it, and disposed of the ashes. We spoke to Miss Lee, the child's mother, to hear her story. Back in 2013, a fire broke out one morning on the first floor of the family's building. The young boy became trapped on the fourth floor. Lee described how the fire brigade failed to bring an axe or any other equipment to break open the fourth floor door. She recalled that the fire chief refused to send firemen inside, saying he wouldn't put a fireman at risk just to save the boy. Lee also explained that the firefighters used old, worn-out water hoses in trying to extinguish the fire. She says they were littered with holes and water could be seen leaking out of them. As a result, the water hoses couldn't maintain a high enough water pressure to put out the fire. Besides the faulty gear, the first responders also refused to use water cannons. Until three hours later, but by that point, the building was already scorched. After the incident, the boy's family set up a memorial for him in front of the burned building. But authorities tore down the display and arrested the family. While they were detained, Lee says authorities stole the boy's corpse and sent it to be cremated. Government officials stole my son's body and they wouldn't even give me his ashes. As of now, we don't know the whereabouts of the ashes. My husband found out where our son had been cremated in 2014. The head of the crematorium said they already disposed of the ashes. Officials informed the crematorium to treat the body as an unidentified corpse. Since the incident, Lee has worked to demand justice for her son, attempting to sue relevant parties. But no court will take on her case. Government officials told me that the government is not responsible for providing any compensation and that I'm not even entitled to ask for compensation. By Lee's estimates, she's owed nearly $600,000 in compensation, both for the destruction of her home and the death of her son. Don Ma reporting, NTD News. Now a look to a Chinese pharmaceutical company. Two weeks ago, Chinese authorities approved the first Chinese-made CCP virus vaccine for general use. It's developed by Sinopharm Group. The company's vaccines also got approved in some other countries. On Tuesday, however, both the chairman of the group and the general manager of one of the group's subsidiaries resigned from their posts. Both resigned for what they called personal reasons. The two of them did not mention the vaccine, but due to their sudden resignation, many people in China are becoming worried about the quality of Sinopharm vaccines. Affected by the resignation, Sinopharm shares value dropped more than 5 percent on Tuesday. Police arrested at least 11 Hong Kongers on Thursday for helping 12 pro-democracy activists escape the city. Among those arrested was Daniel Wong, a Hong Kong lawyer and district counselor. Wong wrote on Facebook that Hong Kong police arrested him at his apartment around 6 a.m. local time. Media outlet Radio Television Hong Kong reported those arrested range in age from the teens to over 70 years old. The group allegedly helped 12 activists to flee to Taiwan on a boat last August. The 12 engaged in protests against the Chinese regime earlier last year. Authorities have detained them in mainland China since August for what they call illegally crossing a border. The youngest of them is 16. The regime refused to allow their families or lawyers to meet with them. A Hong Kong journalist is refusing to bow to pressure from the Chinese regime. She's been charged with making false statements, but says she's determined to uphold press freedom after the passing of Beijing's national security law. NTD's Becky Zhou has the story. Investigative journalist Bao Choi appeared in a Hong Kong court on Thursday, insisting that she's innocent. The 37-year-old was also a producer for broadcaster Radio Television Hong Kong, or RTHK. She lost her job after police laid charges against her. The decision of RTHK management to uh, suspend my role as um, journalist and producer at uh, Hong Kong Collection would be quite disappointing to me. Choi supporters chanted slogans in Cantonese outside the courthouse, repeating the words no fear or selfishness and expressing continued support for Choi. Choi was one of the producers behind a documentary working to expose the Hong Kong police's slow response to a mob attack. Gangsters attacked pro-democracy activists among other commuters at Yuanlong metro station. Several people were badly injured. Police came under fire for failing to rescue the commuters in time. Critics allege authorities colluded with the mafia. Choi was arrested last November and later released on bail. She's due back in court on March 24th for another hearing.
Reporting by Becky Joe and TD News. President Trump is ramping up the crackdown on money flowing to China. A new executive order requires American investors to get rid of their securities holdings tied to Beijing. The order applies to securities from Chinese companies blacklisted by the Pentagon for their ties to the Chinese military. It gives Americans until November 11th this year to comply. The new rule expands on an initial executive order signed last November. That order restricted U.S. investors from buying securities from blacklisted companies. The amendments also prohibit holding securities owned or controlled by Chinese military-linked companies one year after the Pentagon determines that it is. The Pentagon has so far designated 35 companies that are linked to the Chinese military and operating directly or indirectly in the U.S. The U.S. is banning imports of all cotton and tomato products from China's western Xinjiang region. NDD's Patrick Hayden has the details. The U.S. has banned imports on all cotton and tomato products from China's western Xinjiang region. It's the widest action yet to crack down on the use of forced labor of Uyghur Muslims. The ban applies to raw fibers, apparel and textiles made from cotton grown in Xinjiang, which supplies 20 percent of the world's cotton. Tomato-based products from the region are also banned. It also applies to products processed or manufactured in third-party countries. This comes as the UK Conservative politician Benedict Rogers released a comprehensive report that details the extent of human rights abuses across China. He says the situation in Xinjiang has many parallels to the Holocaust. Not only the slave labour, but uh, uh, evidence of a camp forced sterilisation, uh, scenes of uh, people with their heads shaved. Rogers says onto. the existence of concentration camps in Xinjiang is obvious. Being loaded onto trains um, and, of course, uh, the extensive uh, concentration camps uh, in the Xinjiang region, where it's said that at least a million, perhaps as many as three million, uh, are incarcerated, are uh, severely tortured, subjected to sexual violence uh, and, and uh, other abuses. More than 80 global companies are linked to forced labour in Xinjiang. They include Marks & Spencer, Costco, Nike, IKEA, Victoria's Secret and Skechers. The UK this week proposed new rules on preventing goods from Xinjiang entering the country, but many have called the measure insufficient in comparison to the US's strong stance. The EU's recent investment deal with China has also been criticised for not holding China's slave labour activities to account. Reporting by Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Canada is also following the U.S.'s lead. The country is introducing several new measures this week to prevent goods made by Xinjiang's forced labour from entering the Canadian supply chain. A senior U.S. official says the U.S. will always stand with Taiwan. Kelly Kraft serves as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. She had a virtual meeting with Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen on Thursday. In a tweet, Kraft wrote she and President Tsai discussed how Taiwan is a global role model, demonstrated by its success in fighting the virus. She added that they talked about, quote, all that Taiwan has to offer in the fields of health, technology and cutting-edge science. Kraft was originally set to visit Taiwan this week. She would have become the third senior U.S. official who traveled to the island in less than six months. But the State Department canceled the trip, citing transition efforts for the incoming Biden administration. News of the virtual meeting met with anger from Beijing. A foreign ministry spokesperson saying, quote, certain U.S. politicians will pay a heavy price for their wrong words and deeds. The communist regime considers democratic Taiwan part of mainland China and has threatened to bring it under control by force. The U.S. doesn't have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but under the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act, the U.S. provides arms to Taiwan for self-defense. U.S.-Taiwan relations have warmed under the Trump administration. Just last week, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo lifted internal rules regulating how U.S. officials should interact with their Taiwan counterparts. Pompeo claims the rules are the previous administration's efforts to appease Beijing. A Chinese Communist Party or CCP propaganda newspaper is currently delivered to congressional offices of U.S. House members. Last week, however, a Republican congresswoman urged House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to stop the distribution. 
In her letter, Representative Ashley Hinson wrote, quote, This dangerous propaganda is owned, paid for, and written by the CCP. Neither Representative Hansen nor her staff requested the delivery. She added in her letter, quote, This offensive garbage should not be automatically distributed to congressional offices at the cost of American taxpayers. The newspaper China Daily is headquartered in Beijing. It is designated in the U.S. as a foreign mission, meaning it is a propaganda organ for the communist regime. It's also registered as a foreign agent under the U.S. Foreign Agents Registration Act. Its employees have no access to congressional press galleries, but the paper found a loophole to get access to members of Congress. Outside of Congress, China Daily is disseminated to millions of Americans through paid inserts in major U.S. newspapers. These newspapers include the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and Foreign Policy. A House officer says China Daily comes in a packet, and the National News Agency distributes the packets to Congress. The distribution company is based in Maryland. Dave Gasparetti is the vice president for public relations at the National News Agency. In an interview, he initially denied that China Daily is among the publications his company distributes to congressional offices. But he then adds, quote, what we deliver is proprietary and I don't have to tell you. And a senior NASA scientist is coming clean about his China ties. He's pleading guilty on Wednesday to lying about his involvement in a Chinese talent scout program. Prosecutors say the researcher participated in the Thousand Talents program, a Chinese state-run initiative to recruit people who have knowledge of foreign technology. The Justice Department says the program encourages researchers to develop relationships with China in exchange for grants. The scientist reportedly hid his involvement from NASA and the U.S. Office of Government Ethics. He also lied about his membership with the Thousand Talents program when investigators questioned him last October. A China analyst says Americans should be cautious of the tactics used in domestic politics, which mirrors political campaigns that happened in communist China. In China's political movements, the judicial system exists only in name. If the Communist Party wants to start a campaign against a certain group, a label from the state-controlled media is enough to basically convict a group of people. For example, during the so-called anti-rightist campaign, the CCP labeled people as rightists. Or in the Cultural Revolution, they label you as a counter-revolutionary. Even today, many Chinese dissidents are convicted for inciting subversion just because their political opinions differ from the Chinese Communist Party. A China affairs analyst said similar tactics are seen in the U.S. For some, there's no difference between the people who actually committed violence in the U.S. Capitol and those who merely voted for Trump for his policies. The essence is the same, that is, you are guilty for your words and opinions. The judiciary system and due process are gone. The media took their place to convict a huge group of people. Once they are labeled, the whole society will be mobilized to suppress this group of people politically and siege and persecute them in their daily lives. Now in the United States, we are already seeing such phenomena. People who support Trump get kicked off the plane. They are fired by their own companies. He said lawmakers and the media are also treating the capital unrest differently than the Black Lives Matter unrest during the summer. He said judging people of different identities differently when they both commit the same actions is an idea originally from communism. In communism, people are divided into the oppressors and the oppressed, and the two are believed to be forever in conflict. In China and the Soviet Union, what they used is social class, separating the poor from the rich, and then creating a division between these two groups of people, as if the Communist Party represented the interests of the poor and the rich are naturally guilty and bear original sin. Tang says oppressed people are seen in communist ideology as naturally righteous no matter what actions they take. Whether you go to smash and grab, you set things on fire, or do a lot of other bad things, you are still righteous because they are not judging you by your behaviors, whether it's good or bad, but your social identity, which replaced traditional values about right and wrong. He said Americans should be cautious of this line of thinking and not turn to strategies from communist movements. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Canadians are now questioning their country's trade relations with China. This is according to a recent survey.
Canadians who want to decrease trade relations with China are four times more than those who want to increase it. The poll is conducted by Nanos Research and commissioned by CTV News. It shows that 45 percent of respondents believe Canada should decrease trade with China in the future. Only 10 percent says Canada should increase it. Nick Nanos, the founder of Nanos Research, told CTV News on Monday, quote, 10 years ago, China was a market that everyone was looking at. It was a big market, and Canadians want to get in on it. Ten years later, the numbers have turned 180 degrees. Where now people think of China, they think of risks, economic risks, and security risks. The relationship between the two countries has been deteriorating since 2018 when Canada arrested Huawei's chief financial officer, Meng Wanzhou, on a U.S. extradition warrant. Meng was arrested on the grounds of lying to international banks about Huawei's business in Iran. This led the banks to risk violating U.S. sanctions on Iran. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow. Hi, we're happy to announce that you can also catch us on cable TV now. Millions of households already choose us as one of their trusted news sources, and you can too. You can watch us in Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and many other cities as well. And if your system doesn't carry NTD yet, you can just give them a quick call and request NTD on your cable provider. Thank you for watching. See you next time.